Why another documentary about Bob Marley? I think that a lot of things have been done about Bob in the past, whether they be books or films or newspaper articles, whatever, are about the icon, about the legend. And I wanted to make something very simply about the man and to try to understand who he was and try to understand why it is that he continues today to have the resonance that he has and why people still listen to his music and find meaning in it. What was the most unexpected revelation you found out about Bob Marley while doing the film? We've, we find out lots and lots of things that I think people hadn't known before or maybe if some people knew but uh, weren't known generally. Uh, and the way you need to see the film to, under, to understand it all because a lot of, a lot of uh, what we found was, was details, but it's through the accumulation of details that uh, you, you build up a, a true-to-life portrait of the man. Um, but for instance, I think some of the things that uh, impressed me the most, which were, which were the most revealing of him, were about his, his mixed raceness, the fact that he, his father was a white man, his mother was black, and we interviewed his one of his white cousins. And you can see the family resemblance so strongly between this man and, and Bob Marley. And I think to a lot of people it's surprising that this man who is seen as a, a kind of icon of black culture is actually half white. But that's, once you understand that and you, we talk to various people in the, in the family, you realize that it was the division in him, the fact that he wasn't accepted by either the white or the black people in Jamaica that gave him the uh, ambition the drive to succeed. How hard was it to, to get access to his family? To well, they were they, they, the family were um, supportive of the film right from the beginning. They wanted this to happen, and I think they were very open in the interviews that they gave, and, and, and they talk about things that are quite personal and intimate and painful, about how he wasn't necessarily the best father, how um, uh, the women in his life felt a lot of hurt because he was sleeping around a lot and he was betraying one of them for another one. And so they talk very openly about, about this. And uh, I think for the, for, for the children in particular, he had 11 children. And apart from the oldest two who are interviewed in the film, the others didn't really know him very well, or at all really, because they were tiny babies when he died. So. For them, I think they found out a lot about their father. And they said that to me after they saw it. They were crying and they were really moved because they had learned about this man who they'd know, they didn't know about before. So uh, it was a, a wholly um, uh, good experience for me working with them. How important was politics for Bob Marley? Well, I think in some ways, you know, as a Rastafarian, you're not meant to be interested in politics. And he would say, I'm not for the right, I'm not for the left, I'm for the straight way forward. You know, the Rasta way, not the political way. And the, but of course, you can't live in any country without becoming in some way involved in politics. And particularly in Jamaica, where he became um, so important to the, to the politicians because if he said, I'm going to vote this way, then everyone would follow him. And the politicians tried to use him for their own, for their own end. And I think one of the things we do in the film is explain what the politics of the time in Jamaica was and to explain uh, why Bob ended up being uh, shot. Somebody tried to assassinate him and it was because of his involvement with one political party and the other political party wanted to take revenge. Um, but Bob's message was always a message of peace and so he left, he left Jamaica for almost two years after he was, after he was shot and he came back to try and bring the two sides together because there were the, the two political parties had two different gangs who kind of worked for them and who were always shooting each other, hundreds of killings every year. And uh, he came back to bring the back gangs together again. And one of the most mu moving parts of the story is when you see Bob on stage and he's lost in a kind of trance. He's like a religious, spiritual shaman or something. And he holds up the hands of the two leaders of the two parties. And it's very, 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 very moving. He's a, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a man who's bringing peace to the world. Most people associate him with a pot smoking musician. Yeah. How do you think he can still, well, like that, he can still be a role model today? Oh, I think people have a very wrong idea of, of Bob. Yes, he smoked a lot of herb, as they call it in, in, in Jamaica. Um, but he was also incredibly hardworking. And in one way, he's a very conservative role model because 
he shows that you have to work very, very, very hard to be successful. <laughs> Everyone thinks he just smoked and the inspiration came to him and he strummed his guitar. No, no, no. He worked hard, hard, hard. He took tour in the smallest venues in order to build up an audience. And then he would compromise his music. He would, he would change songs to make them more suitable to the R&B market in America if that was the way that he could get ahead, the way that he could, he could be successful. And I think the reason and the way that the original Whalers split up, which is, was him, Peter Tosh, and, and, and Bunny Livingston, is because the other two weren't so ambitious. Bob was ambitious. He worked incredibly hard to get to where, where he went to. But I think the other way that he's a role model is that he's a role model in that he speaks to oppressed people. He speaks to people um, who feel like they're, they're forgotten by society. And whether that be in India or Tibet, people who are, you know, Tibetans who are in exile, who want to go back to their country, they, they sing his songs and they find them political and inspirational. In Tunisia, in the recent Arab Spring, people were in the protests, were singing Bob Marley songs and there's graffiti on the walls of Bob Marley's lyrics. So I think in particular, he speaks strongly politically to um, to the developing world, to people who feel like they've been forgotten by the, by, 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 by the capitalistic system. What made him such a godlike musician? I think partly it's because he was not hypocrite. And I think so many of our pop stars, our rock musicians are hypocrites. You know, they, they talk about, uh, they talk about big ideals or maybe politics or whatever in their in their songs, but then they live the life of the multimillionaire and they uh, hide their money from the tax man and Bob Marley wasn't like that. He did really practice what he preached. He lived very simply. You know, he never had anything but a single bed in his room. He only always slept in a single bed. He, he gave most of his money away. He gave it out to the people who came to his house needing help. Um, he was a man of great integrity. He was a very competitive person. Yes. Normally people don't associate. No, they don't see that. Did that, that surprise you? Yes, I mean, that really surprised me. I think, uh, like you, I had the image of the lazy Rastafarian. <laughs> and I think we have a misunderstanding of Rastafari. I think maybe today it's more of a fashion kind of statement almost than it is anything else. But back in the 1950s and 60s when Rastafari was really at its strongest, it was a political movement and it was about self-improvement, about finding black role models for people. Uh, and they were believers in education and hard work. And so Bob was brought up in that in, 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 in that time when to be a Rastafari wasn't just about smoking. Smoking was the, a part of the religious sacrament, but it was also about um, improving yourself and improving the lot of those around you. What do you think we can learn from Bob Marley today? Well, I think we can, we can learn, for instance, that, uh, uh, um, that hard work is necessary if you want to succeed. But I think uh, uh, in a more spiritual way, I think his message still speaks to people because the world is the same as it was back then. It's still the same injustice, the same inequality that he sang about. And there's still people who feel like they've been forgotten, that they're left out, that they're oppressed. And his music is aimed at them. And people who are oppressed believe him. They believe his message of everything's going to be all right because Bob was in that situation. He really was from a poor, poor country. You remember, he was from the third world. He was from, he's the only star in world music who ever came from the third world. And so he knew about poverty and suffering, and, 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 he, and you can hear that in his voice, that he really means it. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>